BBC. This is Steve Allen's In Conversation, and it all starts next. On FM, online, on your mobile, and on digital radio. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock, for British... Spoke to me about that email. It's his new book, Useful Idiot, How an Email Trumped My Life, which will be available from May as a pre-order on Amazon. I think it's a very British-centric book, because although the topic of it is America, it's Donald Trump, but he yeah. encompasses literally the world. Yeah. You know, people say, well, weren't you shocked you were asked to do something? I said, no, I've never been shocked. I, was a, I got Donald Trump in a music video. I put Muhammad Ali in a bashed up news car once and drove him around Birmingham. Special guest in conversation. You know him from television. You know him because he has a passion. Special guest in conversation. Uh, we go back a long way. We go back about 30 plus years. And I can tell you the day that he walked into our lives at LBC because he came in like a whirling dervish. And within a very short space of time, we found ourselves with Stringfellow celebrity cards. We were going away. He just seemed to have this unique knack of connecting with people, which was strange, really, because I don't know anything about his life before he came to LBC. He stayed with us for a number of years. He went off, and in the interim period, he worked with Michael Jackson. He's worked for an awful lot of big companies. He's worked as a celebrity booker. But he became even more famous than Victoria Beckham when we had those emails, which went backwards and forwards. This is the man who could effectively bring down Donald Trump. Not that he needs any help at the moment, I don't think. Rob Goldstone, it's nice to see you again. It's nice to see you. 32 years. It's 32 years. I think so. Where did you come from, as a yeah. matter of interest? In life, or just...? No, well, I mean, did, did you come from another radio station to us? I did. I came from Birmingham, from BRMB. Right. Yeah. And what were you doing there? Were you reporting there? I was reporting and I was presenting, but they hated me because I couldn't say the word one, or is it one? They said because I was from Manchester, they wouldn't let me on air because I couldn't say the M1 motorway. Right. And it took me years. And I, I don't think I could say it now. I couldn't even say Navratilova, so I was rubbish at the sports <laughs> news. I was, I was always delighted whenever she lost, so I didn't have to repeat the word at all. So you arrive in... And here you are, you're thrown into London, speech radio station, LBC, we're in Gough Square, and then this social world kind of started with Johnny Perry and, and all of the, all of the, who probably listening at the moment, I should imagine, and everybody else, and we would go out, and then people would, he would bring people back to the studio for my program. Boy George turned up one morning. I found him... Um sort of half alive, I think, or half compass mentis outside some London nightclub. And we started talking. Of course, your name always comes up, mainly with people who are half compass mentis. And um, I said, well, why don't you come back with me? And I drove him into your show. i never forget, I just walked in. And it was Boy George. It was very odd, the it whole was, thing. We used to have the oddest times in Gough Square <laughs> overnight. I remember at one time, half of Jim Henson's workshop turned up because we knew somebody. So we've got them all sitting around the table and we're all chatting about bits. And it was just that people... People wanted, we'd, we'd, we'd meet people in Stringfellows, for which we, I had a celebrity card. How did you wangle a celebrity card? I think I just told them you were a celebrity. <laughs> and in those days, there was no internet, so they couldn't check. No, I mean, I don't know. Isn't that bizarre? It was so odd. But you went out there, you got these stories, you came back, you seemed to sort of, you, you were larger than, when I say larger than life, you know what I mean. It's, it's very easy in this business to sort of, to do the job, but to be fake, but you kind of encompassed it. I liked it. I thought if I was going to do a, a, a broadcast job, I may as well kind of make myself a bit larger than life, as you say. Yeah. And so I not only encompassed it, I loved it. Like, I used to hang around this station. Well, it wasn't here, as you know. Yeah. And I would never go home. I quite liked it. It was not only like being in a family, but it was also fun. Yes, I, I think fun is the key word. And also, we were, we were doing... Nobody ever said anything that we weren't to do. We, it, right. it was always a case of, well go and try it. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Whereas now you always edit what you say, obviously. Oh, absolutely. With an yeah. amazing filter. <laughs> I got a cab in here this morning and the cab driver said to me, you have to see Steve Allen. I said, that's so weird. And he goes, only person and only reason we listen to LBC. It's 
There you go. Yeah, bizarre, isn't it? It is yeah. bizarre. I was saying to somebody earlier on, I'm like a social service in the morning. So what do you do now? What, what, what is your job now? Are you a publicist? I am. So I'm a publicist and I'm a, a, a music manager for my sins. Right. And uh, well, literally for my sins. Well, it would be. <laughs> and, um, but I was a publicist and have been for about 20 years or so. Yeah. Uh, before that, I worked with HMV. I helped them open stores all over the world, many of which have now closed. And, um, and my, again, my thing was I used to get the weird and wonderful to come and open those stores. I got Paul McCartney, I got Prince, I did something amazing with Madonna. Just because I think nobody ever asks. It's a bit like how you do your show. You just say what people want to hear. Yeah. And I just used to ask what I thought people would want to do. Yeah. And it's amazing with the world of celebrity, as you know, you wrote a book on it, that they're not used well, you're to very informed. I'm you're good, very right. good. You're good. good. You're good. They're, they're, they're not used to normal people. I no. mean, I went on the road with Michael Jackson as part of his entourage. I remember. And he wasn't used to people saying, like, do you need a pen? Like, there was a huge story about a pen. And I don't think anyone had ever given him a biro <laughs> pen and said, well, just keep it. It's just a pen. And he went on and on about this pen. And it's because they're not normal anymore. They lose all reality. And it's the fault of the people around them. They keep themselves in work by making these people paranoid and somewhat yes. odd. Yeah, well, I remember reading Tamara Eccleston. Uh, she has a staff of 50 in her place. And I'm thinking... To do what? what that's what I said. What do they do? Because if you go to Downton Abbey, the real house, they've got a staff of 14. Right. And that's it. And that's for a place that size. Tamara Ec I, I said, Tamara, they're ripping you off, dear. You don't need 50 people. To run what? Michael Jackson had 144 people on the road. Did I, he? Including chefs and special vegan chefs and non-vegan chefs and people dressed in white to, I don't know, bring him down or take him up or do whatever they did. Oh, but it was bizarre. But nobody ever wants to kind of rock the boat because they fear they'll be the first to go. So, so right. they just keep on this mad pretense and there's a huge white elephant in the room which is... What are we doing? You know, what is it? <clears throat> but I had none of that because I was nothing to do with that. I just happened to be dragged along because his manager said, Oh, we like you. You're the only person he hasn't fired. And I said, Because I don't work for you. <laughs> and so off I went. And, and it was amazing. Absolutely amazing. Did you, get, did you get to see him perform as well? Perform. Incredible. And spent lots of time with him, uh, chatting to him. And sure, he was weird. But, you know, we're all weird in a different kind of way. He yeah. just had an extremely weird life and a weird upbringing. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, I remember uh, when, when he actually died and there were people around here and in Trafalgar Square lighting candles and doing all these sort of things. And I remember thinking, because I'd watched the... DVD of him rehearsing for these shows which he was coming back to do and they kept adding more shows. I kept thinking, he's not going to manage this. He's probably just saying yes because the money had, like Elvis Presley, had trickled away. Money had gone and again, people around him, they didn't care about whether or not, of course a 50 plus man couldn't do that. I mean, Justin Bieber wouldn't be able to do that level of shows. Plus Michael Jackson hadn't performed for years. So yes. it was ludicrous, but it was money. Yeah, well, money, money is the root of all evil. And at the moment, the President of the United States appears to be fighting for his political career. Long before you came on the scene, this was, uh, this was an affair that he had with a, with a porn star who has now been on television to talk about it. He's still denying it. He's issued a writ against her. And then somewhere in the murky past, there's you. There's me. Where do you come into this? Um, I come into it because... Uh... I don't know, again, how I got involved with Donald Trump, but I did, maybe five years ago now, five or six years ago. I was managing a, a, a Russian pop star named Emin, who um, I was trying to break internationally. In fact, that was one of the meetings I had here. And um, I said to him, you need to do a really big event. Why don't we do something like Miss World, Miss Universe, where you get an international audience. You're handsome, you're charming, you sing, you're a bit Ricky Martinish. they'll love you. So we pitched this idea. They liked it at Miss Universe out of the States. And my client also happened to have been, at the time, a, a businessman who owned venues like the O2 Arena. And he said to me, well, why don't you have the contest in Russia? Like, have you ever thought of having it in Russia? And they went, oh, that's a good idea. Well, of course, Donald Trump co-owned that pageant at the time. So I ended up being tasked with bringing him to Moscow, looking after him in Moscow for this pageant. And, and it kind of, you know, I wasn't friends, you know, the press have said, I, was friends with, I wasn't friends with Donald Trump, but I was friendly enough yeah. with Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And I well, you were thought, pitching. I was pitching. And then he said a phrase after which I really liked him. He said to me, has there ever been a greater showman and self-promoter than Donald Trump? And I could have said Steve Allen, but at the time, 
I just went, you didn't. I didn't. Thanks. And Because <laughs> you would have been dragged into this as I well. I would have been dragged into this. <laughs> but, you know, it went from there. And it was kind of like, he was this brash kind of, you know, blustering thing. And um, I quite liked him on that level. And, and then he said a couple of years later, you know, I'm going to run for president, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> and, but not the most, the most hilarious thing he ever said to me on one. He said to me, have you done something with your hair? And I said, we're not having a hair debate, surely, you and I, because you'll lose. <laughs> and, and so it, it went on from there. And, and then, you know, a year or two, move on, we did a very successful event there, move on. I was asked by this same Russian client if I could set up a meeting for some friends of his father or some acquaintances. And I never thought very much of it, except it was bizarre. It was politics. Trump was running for politics. So I kind of tried to talk them out of it. And in the end, I was like, fine, OK, I'll ask for the meeting. And I was told, you don't have to go to it. You don't have to report on it. You don't have to, all you're doing is asking for a meeting. How hard can that be? So I asked for a meeting. And the answer is very hard from now on. I mean, I got them the meeting. But as a result, because these were Russians that went in there and it was thought one of them may have government connections, it suddenly became the spark that kind of has launched this Russiagate inquiry. And my email is front and center of it. A simple email that I dashed off, like sometimes from, from the States where I live, I'll dash you a little te yeah. text that says, I'm listening to you, it's very fun. Well, it was written in about the same amount of time three minutes and it's become this is quite good actually it's become the most famous email in history that's quite nice yeah and I didn't even have to say that no so that's quite good so I'm writing a book as a result I am I'm writing a book called Useful Idiot How an Email Trumped My Life there, there, there was talk that you know you could sort of bring down Trump from both sides so the Democratic side which would be like the Labour Party here type of thing Liberals Labour um they hated me. At one point, they said I was the most hated man. Charles Manson and I were the most hated men in America. I pointed out that Charles Manson's now dead, which leaves me in the number one position. But, um, but then they changed their tune, which is, well, just a minute, you could actually bring, not me personally, but the meeting I set up and the email yeah. could bring down Donald Trump. I think it's a bit far-fetched, that statement, however. And then on the other side, you know, first they talk about was there collusion, was there anything, and that's not my world. You know, my world is, can we get your radio on? Yeah, can we get your radio on? That's good. Can, can we get you on the can radio? Can we get your radio? Yeah. Yes. And so um, I, I find it all very bizarre, and what I found the most bizarre was that how was I in the middle of all of this? I'm from Manchester, and I can't say one. <laughs> that should have been the title of the book. I'm from Manchester. What do I know about it? Exactly. It is bizarre. Listen, very quick break. More from Rob Goldstone. His email to Donald Trump took uh, three minutes. He says, I never thought it would be read by the world. He became more famous than Gemma Collins. <laughs> and uh, so more from him after this. Coming up at... In conversation with... On LBC... Special guest, Rob Goldstone. The book, how far into the book are you? It's almost finished. Um, it should be out, I would say, the first week of June. Right. And do the Ameri I mean, is this going to be launched America or here? Both. Both. Simultaneously. Yeah. Simultaneously, because, again, it, I'm told, I, I don't know that world either, that now we have Amazon and everything's online. Yes. Yes, it will be in bookstores, but most people apparently just, you know, they hear something, then suddenly they just buy it and it's there yeah. next day. Oh, it, I think, it's, uh, to be honest with you, I spend most of my working life on Amazon. I just, I can't help it. I just sort of sit, but you're right, I'll hear something said on the radio and I'll think, oh, I'm going to go check that one out. And so I check it out and go, I'll buy it. Exactly. And that's, and that's what I do. So this is quite exciting. So do you think that the, the Americans are going to take to this in the same way? Are they going to go, oh, let's embrace this, this little man from Manchester? I, I think <laughs> it's a very British-centric book because although the topic of it is America, it's Donald Trump, but he yeah. encompasses literally the world. Yes. And, um, but there's a lot of anecdotal stuff about uh, me and my crazy life because the point I tried to make to people was... I did, you know, people said, well, weren't you shocked you were asked to do something? I said, no, I've never been shocked. I, was a, I got Donald Trump in a music video. I put Muhammad Ali in a bashed up news car once and drove him around Birmingham. It's, I wasn't, you know, I was in a kitchen with Tom Cruise, I tell that. And he said to me, this is very you actually, he said to me, are you going to tell me that story of when comedian Jerry Lewis threw a salami at you? 
And I said, this is the weirdest thing anyone's ever said, but there was a reason for it, and it's yeah. funny. So those things, a bit like, don't phase me. So being asked to call the Trumps and set up a meeting for someone yeah. was kind of like every day. The content of it wasn't every day, but being asked to do it doesn't really phase me at all. It's interesting. Well, you, well I mean, you, you thrive on that, don't you? Exactly. Like, you, you quite like that. That's like, you know, where, where will today take me? Right. And the answer is, I've got no idea, but I'm looking forward to the journey. Exactly. And I think that's always been your philosophy. You've always gone through life. I always remember years ago, you were always sort of, you know, I know it's a bit of a cliche, happy, jolly man, you know, and all this right. kind of stuff, but you obviously enjoyed what you did. You enjoyed the meetings. We, you, you enjoyed, as you said, you hardly ever left LBC because you'd just be there and have a kip there and then go out for a reporting shift in the morning. Right, and then and find another story on the way back. Yes. Type of thing. So is, is your life now as exciting as it was then? Or do you think it's, I mean, as you've got a bit older... And I don't even know how old you are now, but I'm... I'm, I'm in my late 30s. <laughs> oh, no, it can't be. It was 32 years since I was on your show. <laughs> yes, I'm in my late 30s. Oh, that doesn't work No, anymore. that didn't work, did yeah. it? No. I'm in my 50s. 50s. Yeah. Yeah. Do you like being in your 50s? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because I'm, I always thought to myself that you were probably never happy with the way you were, you know, because we all want to change, and as you know, we've all got a bit older, you know, a bit greyer, mm. a bit wider round, round the middle, but I thought you would have been affected more by that than anything else. Well, often because of the types of people I, I hang around with, you know, yeah. you go to do things in LA, and people, I mean, they're not even human anymore, you know, they're just yes. little put-together bits. Yes. Uh, I remember <laughs> doing stuff with Joan Rivers, and she looked at this person over there and said, I think that's like a mini-me of herself. Look, she's walking around with a little version of herself made from loose skin. And so it's kind of like, you know, there is this need to look the part, but I've never bought into that. I don't care. I just, I sort of just... People in America often say to me, you know, you're a bit Simon Cowlish, you say these outrageous things, but people quite like it, and it's exactly yes. what you do. That's why a cab driver would say that to me. That's why when I make people sit and listen at ungodly hours in the morning to you in America, they go, this is hilarious, you could never say stuff like this in America. Yeah. Well, you could, but they don't. I'm slightly disturbed about Trump at the moment because of the, uh, the, um, the porn actress. Because somebody's telling fibs. Well, and, and the irony of that is there's a, there's a large swathe of his, of his base that doesn't really care about it. No. But what they all care about is it's not the porn actress that could bring him down, as it were, but it's how she was paid off that could bring him down. Because there's some legalese, which is, you know, if campaign funds, it was found, were ever used to pay off. Well, that is something that could have serious consequences. Uh, so the reason they're making such a big deal over this is because is. she was paid and there's an admittance of kind of, oh, yes, she was. And, and that's the issue with it. So like the fact I, that he had an affair, I'm not saying no one cares, but that's not impeachable. Yeah, well, strange enough, I, th I thought the same as you. So he had sex with somebody else who wasn't his wife, who wasn't expecting a baby. Why is there such a big deal about yeah, it? that's and for you his think, wife to deal with. That's right. If they want to deal with that and they get set, that's up to them. You know, I'm sure they have arguments, same as any other couple. But it was it was the fact that she'd apparently had to sign some document. She right. got paid $92,000 right. or something. And so she's saying it. He's now denying it and is countersuing for $20 million right. to say she's she's broken the embargo. And thinking, so did it happen or didn't it happen? Exactly. Obviously it did. It obviously it did. But she's taken a lie detector. She's wow. taken a lie detector. And, you know, he's suing because she signed what's called a non-disclosure agreement. What but does that mean? It means that you agree that if you... The royal family do it often. Um, right. That if you speak about things that go on in there, you can be sued, and will be sued, not just can be, but will be. Right. And they kind of frighten you to death a bit and say... They should have done your full barrel, should have shut him up years well, ago. Well, it was thought he would have had one, but it doesn't seem that he did. No. Or the time lapsed was enough that he could then speak. Very odd, isn't Very it? Very odd. Because I, my argument is, he always says, you know, Diana said I was her rock. Well, there's no evidence to suggest that at all. There's right. nothing on record, nothing written down, nothing. So whether it was made up, I don't know. And he's come up with some odd things before. But the royal family don't like to embroil themselves in anything to be caught. And or... she's not here. To she's the not only here. one that would ever have come on your show and denied it would have been her. Oh, I'd love to have talked to her. Oh, my God. God, I'd have paid money for that. You two would actually, have been very good. Yeah. I'm sure she listened into for sure. Oh, I think so. I think she liked a good gossip. And the other person I said this morning I'd love to talk to, I'd love to talk to Putin. Right. I, I, I would think he'd be a really interesting person. You know, very powerful. But I think probably he's never had a conversation... A normal conversation. On a normal level. Like Michael Jackson right. and you. Yeah. 
And so well, the, you know, the, the, there's an interesting um, uh, story I tell in my book that was when Trump was in Moscow with me for the pageant, there was all this talk, would he meet Vladimir Putin? It was the big story of the time. Would he, wouldn't he? And of course, Trump famously said, he's my friend, he's my best friend. Of course, he never met or spoke to the person. And um, so we were trying to see if there was a way that they could actually meet. And um, on the day of the actual contest, back in 2013, a message came through to say that due to the tardiness of the newly crowned King of Holland, President Putin was delayed, so couldn't meet Trump. So I decided that I would dedicate my book to the King of Holland. Because if he hadn't been late, I would have been the person who would have taken Trump to meet Putin, and my life would just about have been over, I would imagine. Yes, I would have thought we wouldn't be sitting here we now. We wouldn't be sitting anywhere. No, no. no. So, what, what was Trump like? Interesting character? Is he as bombastic? Is there a weak side to it? Does he have a weakness well, apart from... The weak side, I think, is that he's like a child. So his behaviour is very much uh, instantaneous. It's, you can see it. There's no real filter. And he's a bit Simon Couch. He says what people want to hear, but and sometimes what people don't want to hear. Yes. But there's no filter. And I think he would say, well, that's what you voted for. That's why you elected me, because I said I was different, I wasn't Washington, I wasn't going to stick to the rules. Now, I haven't been involved with him since he's been in politics, really. I haven't even seen him since then. But beforehand, I like the fact that he was... Um, a character this like larger than life mm. self-promoter there's a great instance where he was at a business meeting i was at and they asked him about the european debt crisis and obviously he had no idea i mean he knew where europe was and he said before i answer that have you ever watched the apprentice on television <laughs> and he spoke for about 20 minutes about the apprentice and how amazing he was stood up and thanked everyone and got a standing ovation and it was after that that he said to me has there ever been a better self-promoter than Donald Trump? And I thought, you have something there. Yeah. There is something to be said for that. Because you just talked about yourself for 20 minutes. Yes. To business leaders who wanted to hear about the Greek bailout or something. <laughs> so, you know, I famously or infamously said that I thought America was like a reality show and Trump was the perfect reality show president. Yes. I mean, that's the only way I can look at it, which yeah. is, you know, more people apparently at one time voted for a final of American Idol than had voted in the election. So, I mean, that to me just kind of sums it up, really. I think he made himself relatable, even if you didn't like him, yeah. and she made herself brilliantly untouchable. Yes. I yes. think those were the two. One's the ice queen, and one's this blustering, kind of almost <laughs> bumbling buffoon. But people like that, who, ca who said all the time, I'm like you. But you're not really. Yeah, no, that's it's like the royal family. We're just like you. No, you're not. Yeah, you're not. They're totally different. And he was saying that because then certain sections of the people will warm to him. It's like Putin when they had the elections in Russia. You know, he didn't need to fiddle it. He's very popular. The Russian people like him. A lot of people have done very well under under Putin. And, and I heard um, an old wives' tale, but I found it fascinating as to why he has his grip on power. Um, I was working with a translator over there, and she said to me at lunch one day, well, you know the story of Putin, why he's untouchable. She said that the Russians believe, especially religious Russians in the Orthodox Church, that when the Tsar and his family were assassinated and mm. executed, a curse was put on the country. And they believe that Putin was the person who broke that curse and brought them back to being a respected world power and a force to be reckoned with. Before that, they believed they were just this miserable, bread-eating, you know, yeah. people standing in lines. And they, the more people I spoke to, they all told me that story. Well, if you're fighting that, and if that's like, a, you're a myth, almost, so you're right, it's not about fiddling it, it's that, you know, these millions and tens of millions of people believe you're almost like a demigod on some level, mm. so you would vote for him. And also, there's no one else to vote for. Book's called? The book is called Useful Idiot, how an email trumped my life. By Rob Goldstone, who's been our special guest today. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. If I have to come back in 32 more years, <laughs> sure, be here. Well, I hope so. I'll certainly do my best. <laughs> my thanks to this week's guests, Dan Snow and Rob Goldstone. You can hear an extended version of both of those interviews on our podcast service. I'll be back next week with more celebrity guests. And don't forget, you can listen to LBC whenever you want, wherever you are. Download the free LBC app for your mobile or tablet and never miss a moment. Leading Britain's conversation at one, it's Darren Adam. But right now, it's Ian Collins.
Now, will I live longer if I become a vegan or will it just seem longer?